Okay, so I'm gonna start my presentation. Um, I'm not sure what everybody's seeing. I hope you all can hear me and see me fairly well. Uh, my name's Frank Clavetto. I'm the executive director of the South Fork Natural History Museum. And I wanna welcome you all to uh, another edition of SOFO's Zoom online programming. Uh, today's topic is uh, Birds of the South Fork Spring Migration. Um, I'm set up uh, in front of our spring migration exhibit on the upper level of the museum. Uh, first and foremost, I hope everybody's doing well and staying safe. Um, it's very important that we practice the guidelines and SOFO's mission uh, is to continue doing programming, uh, bringing information and the education that fulfills our mission to you at home. And uh, today I hope I can do that. Um, so to give you an overview, um, I'm just doing this welcoming introduction for all of you and then I have a PowerPoint set up with different images of different migratory birds that visit us here on the South Fork. Uh, throughout the world, there is about 10,000 bird species uh, around the world and about half of them are migratory, which means during the spring season, starting in March, um, many of these birds in mass quantities move from their wintering ground to north to their breeding ground. So they move from a south to north direction in the spring. In the fall is another migratory movement known as fall migration, where they move from their northern breeding grounds uh, to their wintering grounds. So um, as of right now, uh, spring migration has started in mid-March with the ospreys returning to Long Island and uh, followed by a lot of other species. Every day there's new species that are arriving, uh, timing their arrivals based on food source, and um, also trying to establish nesting sites uh, in their breeding ground habitats. Okay, so I'm gonna um, just set up my laptop and then I'm gonna talk as I, I move along through the presentation. All right, so this mass movement known as spring migration um, billions of birds are on the move this time of year. And um, a lot of the passerines, which are perching birds, move at night, uh, like our wood warblers that visit us here on Long Island and establish nesting sites, they, they move at night. Um, but they, they, they move in mass quantities, uh, sometimes millions at a time. But throughout the world, there are billions and billions of birds uh, on this wonderful journey known as spring migration. Uh, this is a picture of uh, American oyster catchers moving along the beach. These are uh, breeding birds here on the South Shore of Long Island. Uh, they breed on islands in um, like areas like Shinnecock Bay and uh, Gardner's Bay along those uh, barrier islands. You'll see American oyster catchers with young throughout the summer, but uh, they're one of the first shore, birds, first shore birds that arrive here on the South Fork uh, for breeding purposes. So there are four major flyways uh, in the United States. The one that we're most used to is the Atlantic Flyway. Uh, so um, the Atlantic Flyway uh, is bordered by an ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and it compels birds to hug the coastline during their migration journeys. Uh, this flyway includes over the water jaunts as birds cross the Gulf of Mexico. It also includes routes that jump to Cuba and other Caribbean islands. The other uh, migratory pathway is known as the Pacific, the Central, and the Mississippi Flyway uh, allow birds to move north and south uh, through different corridors. And these flyways uh, basically are conducive for bird migrations because there's a lot of resources and protection during their migration. Migration is a very challenging um, activity. So with food sources and uh, ways that they can uh, adapt and utilize maybe the ridges of mountain ranges throughout the United States is what um, is how birds use the different flyway uh, patterns uh, throughout the United States. So as I said earlier in mid-March we first see our first migratory birds arrive on the South Fork. Uh, the ospreys they come around mid-March and if you notice, if you're an avid birder or if you're outdoors a lot, you'll notice that a lot of our uh, nesting platforms um, are occupied by pairs all summer long. So when they arrive in mid-March, they start pairing up 
with the same mates that they've had throughout their lifetime. And um, sometimes a new um, reproductively mature, newly reproductively mature ospreys will fight with other adults for nesting sites. Um, but there's a lot of man-made platforms to help the, um, the ospreys sustain their populations here on the South Fork. So this for me is the first sign uh, of spring migration when the ospreys return in mid-March. Uh, the other sign for me is when I start hearing red-winged blackbirds calling. Uh, this is another breeding bird here on the South Fork. They come up from southern areas, even as far south as South America, and they come up to the South Fork where they establish nesting sites, and they're very territorial, and their calls are very, um, they're, they're very unique uh, calls that only occur in the spring. You won't hear them call uh, that kikari sound later on in the in the late in the summer months because they've established nesting sites already. But this is another bird that is uh, relative to the spring migration here on the South Fork. This uh, might be a familiar bird to all of you. This is a shorebird. It's an endangered species known as a piping plover. They arrive in March, and they nest on uh, sandy beaches here on the South Fork of Long Island. Uh, piping plovers are uh, very unique nest builders. They, they, they burrow, they, they build little burrows in the sand and lay clutches up to three eggs, but they're migratory too. They're from way down south. They come up uh, in early spring to establish nesting sites here on the beaches of Long Island. So then we have our wetland birds. These are wading birds. We're very familiar with some of these birds. Uh, when we frequent beaches and wetlands uh, here on the east end. This here is a great egret. Uh, this is a migratory bird. Sometimes they linger longer than they need to uh, because of the mild winters we've been having. We've been seeing great egrets sticking around a little longer than they need to. Um, they basically feed in creeks and shallow uh, waters of bays and harbors. But if they stick around too long and the weather gets too cold, they, will have, they won't have a food source. They're not diving birds, so they have to rely on shallow environments uh, to feed on the small fish and crustaceans that are in that habitat. This is a snowy egret. It's a little smaller than the great egret. It's also a migratory bird. Notice the yellow feet. That's a field mark um, that distinguishes the great egret from the snowy egret. Uh, this is also a bird that is migratory and utilizes the same wetland habitat as the great egret. It's also a wading bird, so they have to leave by the end of the summer or during the fall season because, again, like I said earlier, if they stick around too long and it gets too cold and those shallow, those shallow environments, uh, embayment environments, start to freeze over, then they jeopardize themselves by not having a food source to survive. This is a familiar uh, bird, one of the largest wingspan birds here on the South Fork. This is a great blue heron. Uh, it's also a wading bird, and it also utilizes wetlands, and they're migratory too. Again, if they stick around longer than they have to, areas that they feed in will freeze, and they will not have a food source, and will starve and die during the winter months. Uh, black crown night heron, also a wading bird, part of the heron family. They breed here on Long Island. Um, there's also another uh, a night heron that, that breeds on Long Island. It's called a yellow crown night heron. Um, but that's more of an, an uncommon bird that we don't see that often. Um, but all of these birds are migratory. They come up uh, during May, June, and um, establish nesting sites. And some of them breed here, and some of them move north to other breeding areas. Uh, these are birds that frequent grasslands, like behind the museum, we have a vineyard field, and the bird to the left is tree swallows, and the bird to the right are purple martin. Uh, they're our largest swallows that come to Long Island. And just uh, yesterday, we just um, had our first two males and female arrive to our purple martin colony. So during spring migration, every day, more birds arrive uh, just based on their travels and, um, and the energy that they have to get to their breeding ground. So hopefully these birds will uh, establish a large colony again this year in the back of the museum, the Purple Martins. 
And last year we had 115 fledglings at our colony and hopefully this year we'll have more. But these birds are so important for a habitat like our grassland habitat behind the museum because they're aerial feeders and are, and are insectivores. So uh, they control mosquito and insect populations. If these birds were not around, uh, then we'd be overwhelmed with a large insect population. So these birds are necessary, they, they are native, and uh, they've evolved to basically uh, nest in grassland habitats, such as the one behind the museum, and to control the ecosystem. They basically uh, are balance keepers of the mosquito population here on the South Fork. And by the way, tree swallows to the left compete with bluebirds because they're cavity nesting birds and they compete with bluebirds for nesting sites. Uh, so the bluebird boxes that you see around the South Fork, you'll see tree swallows and they're more than bluebirds because tree swallows are a little bit more territorial and more aggressive than the bluebirds are. But they're both native, so uh, first come, first serve, the strongest survive. So if the tree swallows push out the bluebirds, then uh, so be it. So then we have our, you know, very interesting and difficult, challenging birds to identify that uh, breed here on Long Island. These are the wood warblers of the South Fork. Uh, this here is a, a pine warbler. It's one of the first warblers to arrive on the South Fork. Um, they, they nest and call in pine forests and pine trees. So if you're out on a walk and you hear a uh, chirping sound coming from the pine trees this time of year, chances are it's a pine warbler. Uh, this here is a very popular bird in the back of the field and in the woodlands. Um, it's known as a yellow warbler. Uh, it's a beautiful bird. They also breed here and nest here on Long Island. Again, these are all birds that migrate hundreds if not thousands of miles to come to Long Island. So a small little bird that only weighs a few ounces um, has a challenging trek to get here for nesting purposes. This is a black and white warbler also a breeder of, on, in Long Island. We have about 13 or 14 breeding warblers on Long Island. I'm only just showing you a few here. Um, Joe Junta, who's a, a member and a, a program leader here, does a, a breeding warbler walk each year. And um, he tries to search. It takes a long time, but he usually gets all the breeding warblers on his walk. So it's a great walk. And if you see it on our description on the programs, and uh, we're out of this, pandemic and we can get back outdoors, I ask everyone to please sign up for that walk. It's a great walk and Joe's a great presenter. Uh, this here is a blue winged warbler. Uh, they breed right here on, on SOFO's property. Um, I haven't heard any yet, but in a few weeks, one or two should arrive and they'll be making that uh, two note call and, and the warblers will, they'll, they'll start breeding here in the trees here along, around the South Fork of the museum. This is a ground nesting bird. It's a warbler. It's known as an oven bird. Uh, it makes a pretty unique call in the woods when it's calling uh, a mate or it's being territorial. Um, it's one of the smaller warblers here on the South Fork, but that's a breeding warbler here. This is known as a northern parula or parula, however you want to pronounce it. Um, this is another beautiful looking uh, wood warbler. It breeds in the oak forest here on the South Fork. They come all the way up from South America. I was down in Colombia, uh, I mean, in Costa Rica a couple of years ago, and believe it or not, northern perulas are very rare down there, but there, there was one down there when I was down there. So they traveled many miles to get to their breeding grounds. This is one of the uh, warblers that Joe Junta identifies on his walk. This is an American Red Start. Uh, they, they breed here on Long Island too. Some, some warblers that we see during spring migration don't all breed here. Some of them just stop over, forage, get the energy necessary uh, to continue their journey to their breeding grounds up north. But the ones that I'm showing you now are pretty much breeding, breeding warblers of the South Fork. So we'll see them throughout the summer and during spring migration. This here is a palm warbler. It breeds here on Long Island. Um, it actually has a unique field mark where it wags its uh, tail in the back. So it's a good field mark to identify this bird. But this is also another migratory bird, another wood warbler that migrates to Long Island. 
And then these guys are neotropical birds that I'm showing you. This is a scarlet tanager. And scarlet tanagers are very unique birds. They, right before the breeding season, the males are almost like an olive green, like they're like they're like the females are. Females stay olive green throughout the whole year. But but male scarlet tanagers change from olive green to this scarlet red color during the breeding season. And then after the breeding season, its plumage changes back to an olive green like the female. Neotropical birds migrate all the way from South America uh, all the way onto the South Fork. This is a summer tanager. It's another neotropical bird from South America, comes up and breeds on Long Island. Um, I don't see many uh, summer tanagers as I do scarlet tanagers. Um, again, birds are bioindicators of the environment. So when you don't see certain species that were once abundant here on the South Fork, that's an indication that something's wrong. Chances are it's probably overdevelopment, habitat destruction, or perhaps the, their food source is not uh, frequent as it used to be due to pesticide spraying or whatever reason. So again, bioindicators tell us a story, tells us uh, why these birds, maybe why these birds are declining. This is a great crested flycatcher. Uh, it breeds in, in the oak forest here on the South Fork. They, they nest in the high canopies of trees and they're very hard to see during the summer months because most of the trees have leaves on them, obviously. Uh, but you can hear their voices and once in a while you can make them out on the top of the, can the canopies of trees. They like to eat caterpillars and different insects that also eat leaves on top of trees. So the great crested flycatcher utilizes the top of trees to, for, as a food source for, for its sustainability. This is a uh, gray catbird. You know, a lot of people uh, take these birds for granted, but this is also a neotropical migrant from South America. Uh, they breed here on Long Island. You know, they make little calls like a cat sometimes, um, but they're also territorial and they mimic, they mimic species. They, they, they mimic other bird calls. So sometimes as a birder, it confuses you. Uh, like northern mockingbirds, sometimes they chirp different calls and you think it's this particular species and it's the great catbird, the northern mockingbird, that's making the call of another species. The great catbirds are also neotropical migrants. Baltimore Oriole, which breeds on the property of the South Fork of Long Island. Uh, this bird here is a um, migrant and they're, they make beautiful calls and it almost sounds like a flute call when they're breeding and looking for mates here. On Long Island. So Baltimore Oriole. We also get Orchard Oriole too, which is not indicated in this slide. Those two beautiful Orioles that we get here on Long Island. And this here is a prothonotary warbler. It, it used to breed here on Long Island and it probably still does, but it's not as common as it used to be. Uh, prothonotary warblers um, are just beautiful birds. I've only seen one on the South Fork in my 20 years as a birder, but I don't go out as often as I should. Yeah. But it's a beautiful bird. I've seen prothonotary warblers in, um, in Costa Rica as well. This bird is one of my favorite birds. It breeds in the grasslands behind the museum. It's strikingly uh, blue. It's, uh, it's called an indigo bunting. And uh, one of our late board members, uh, Eric Salzman, claims that the vineyard field behind the museum is one of the great spots for, nest, for indigo buntings to nest in on all of Long Island. And when this bird is uh, calling in the spring, when it arrives, it makes such a beautiful call and the males are just strikingly blue like the picture that you see here. Um, so during the summer months and at the end of the summer, these birds are abundant in the back of the field. And uh, hopefully you can join us if things get back to normal to search for them in one of our field programs later on in the summer. Indigo bunting. Then we have our shorebirds. Uh, we live on an island, so we have an abundance of shorebirds that migrate from South America and different places around the world to come to Long Island to have young. This is, this is a willet. It's a very common bird in the summer. Um, it's a shorebird. It's one of the larger shorebirds that we see on Long Island, but it's a migratory bird as well. American oyster catcher. They're here now. They're breeding. This was the, one of the slides that I showed you earlier in this presentation, a flock of American oyster catchers moving along the, the barrier beach or one of the beaches here on the South Fork. Uh, they raise their young here too, they're migratory. And they're, they're pretty much here now and will stay here throughout the summer, raising their young. 
This is a very unique bird. This is known as a red knot. Uh, red knots are, uh, they migrate from the Tierra de Fuego areas of South America, the southern tip of Argentina. Uh, they migrate thousands of miles to the Arctic Circle, which is where their breeding grounds are. But during their migration, during their, their, uh, during their flight to their breeding grounds, they time uh, their stopover here on the South Fork in accordance to when the horseshoe crabs lay eggs during uh, May and June. So the horseshoe crab eggs provide a, an exceptional nutritional value for migrating shorebirds, such as red knots and ruddy turnstones. Um, certain gulls also um, take advantage of the horseshoe crab eggs uh, during the, the mating season and the breeding season of horseshoe crabs. So the red knots uh, travel close to 7,000 miles through their migration to and from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. And they rely on horseshoe crab eggs uh, for that energy source to continue their migration. This is a ruddy turnstone. This is also uh, another shorebird that utilizes the horseshoe crab eggs to uh, travel to its breeding grounds up in the Arctic Circle. And then we have our turns, you know, when you're out on the water on a boat or if at the beach, sometimes you'll come across some terns that are feeding in the bays and harbors and even sometimes out in the oceans where schools of fish are breaking water. This is known as a common tern. Uh, the, they're not here yet, but they're slowly working their way up north and would be, probably will be here in probably like another month or so, probably mid-May or early June. Least terns, these are the smallest terns out of the, the tern family. Uh, they breed on beaches such as Meacock's Bay and. Uh, different beaches that we frequent during the summer. Sometimes they're, they're very territorial and sometimes will dive, dive bomb people if you get too close to their nest. They're, they're a species of great concern. I think they're, I believe they're threatened species in New York State now, so they're protected. So just like the piping plover, a lot of the beaches are fenced off for the protection of uh, the nesting of these birds. This is a rosette tern. Um, they also breed on the South Fork, on the North Fork too, and the islands in between. Uh, this is a bird that you will see during the summer months, they're migratory. So uh, they do have young here on Long Island, so they trek thousands of miles as well to get here uh, for nesting purposes. And then we have our just typical backyard birds that you guys are familiar with. Um, you know, some of these birds are year round, most of them are year round, but some of them are migratory. So just because you see a northern cardinal year round doesn't mean that's the cardinal that you see that's resident here. Sometimes they migrate from distances as far south as Florida, perhaps, or even, you know, Delaware or somewhere where there's warmer climate during the winter months, they come up north for nesting purposes. So this is your northern cardinal. We all know that. Uh, blue jay. Um, which we, we see so often. If you look at a blue jay through a scope or through your binoculars, they're a striking bird. I think we take them for granted, but just their plumage is, is incredible. Uh, what's this guy? Northern Mockingbird. This is a breeder of Long Island. It's a typical bird here on the back of the museum and throughout the South Fork of Long Island. Again, these are usually resident birds and not migratory birds. Black-capped chickadee, this is a bird that we see at Morton Wildlife Refuge when we feed birds with some seed out of our hand. They're the ones that come to our hands and are around our feeders and are year-round resident of the South Fork. Uh, this is an American goldfinch. They're also migratory, but they're year-round as well. So you see them year-round, but some of them do come up uh, from their wintering grounds up north to their breeding grounds here on Long Island. Tufted titmouse, year-round bird, but could also be migratory. And this is uh, an American robin. And I've just noticed a whole flock of American robins that just arrived in the back of the field. I'm sure they were migrating. When you see flocks of birds in, in huge numbers at one time during the day, chances are this was a, a migrating flock that came down as the sun comes up in the morning and they, they migrate at night. When the sun comes up, they pretty much drop down to a migration trap where they can eat and forage and gain the energy necessary uh, to continue the migration or to start building nests and to, uh, and to mate and create offspring for the summer. American robins can have four clutches, four broods per year. So that's why they're very abundant 
and uh, they start breeding right away and they can have up, like I said, up to four broods. That's like 16 offspring in one season. So that's pretty much the images that I have in my PowerPoint presentation. Um, just bear with me one second. Okay, so I hope you all can see me. So that's, that's my PowerPoint presentation, but I just wanna uh, just inform everyone about certain um, tools when you go out birding. Uh, these field guides that I have in my hand are very useful. They're great guides to uh, learn about the different birds that migrate to Long Island. Um, this is uh, Peterson's field guide to birds of Eastern and Central North, uh, Eastern North America and Central America. So this will give you a good indication of the migratory birds that come to Long Island. And this is the Sibley's field guide to birds of Eastern North America. And most importantly, is you have binoculars. Uh, without binoculars, it's gonna be hard to uh, look at the different field marks that uh, these birds have at different times of the season. So uh, with that said, uh, I just wanna thank everyone for, for being here for this presentation. I just wanna remind everybody that next week, I will be doing another presentation on next Wednesday at 4 p.m. titled Vernal Ponds and Their Ecosystems. Uh, I plan to have some of our uh, native salamanders and frogs that utilize those habitats uh, on, that, on that presentation. And then the following week for Earth Day, April 22nd, we have a special presentation with Jungle Bob. Uh, he's gonna be having different exotic animals uh, that he'll be showcasing from his site uh, up island. Yeah, I believe he's in Hedgehog. So, um, so be, be aware, look at our website for more upcoming scheduled Zoom programs. And again, I'm Frank Lovetto, the director of the museum, and thank you for being here this afternoon. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone.